Okay. And we're recording, Shirley. And, and on time. Amazing. Yes. I remember. <laughs> Thank you, okay. Adrian. So, Are and you muting everyone? Just mute everybody, and except for me and Stuart, because the dogs are, it's probably Miriam's dogs, I know. <laughs> okay, all yours, Stuart. Okay, oh, well, thank you, Shirley. Thanks for inviting me. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something that I couldn't do if I did this on Shabbat morning, um, which is I'm going to use a, a PowerPoint presentation. So let's, uh, I'm going to try to do that now. And... Okay, so I just, um, I just published this book in the last few months. It was uh, supposed to come out just right in the middle of the, what turned out to be the pandemic. It got delayed a little bit, but it's, it's finally out. I don't, I don't think anybody seems to have noticed um, because nobody really wants to talk about uh, sexual offenses anymore. There, we have other topics to focus on, but I'm glad that you all could um, come out tonight as it were and, and um, listen to my presentation. Um, I so the book, mention, Stuart, that Kearney is holding up your book. So ah, okay. he actually has Thank a you. copy. <laughs> um, and I can tell you at the end how you can get it for yourself. So, <laughs> um, so this book is actually the third uh, installment in what's turned out to be a series of books. That I didn't know it at the when I started, but it's turned out to be a sort of um, theoretical or philosophical. Uh, walk through a number of different problematic criminal offenses. The first book dealt with white collar crime and the second installment dealt with theft and property crimes. Um, and this one deals with the sexual offenses. So just to, to you're gonna, you'll forgive me because I'm gonna start out with some fairly text heavy slides, but as we go on, um, we'll have much less of that. So I just wanna try to set up what the, the problem that I'm addressing is um, and um, put it in some historical context. So if you look back at the middle of the 20th century, you can observe um, what I think is a striking divergence in the way we regulate and, and particularly criminalize sexual behavior. On the one hand, we've become markedly more punitive in how we approach sexual conduct that is non-consensual. Um, if you think about the, the, the sort of broader way that we define rape um, and sexual assault um, and the creation of new offenses um, such as sex trafficking, child grooming and revenge porn that didn't exist, you know, before, uh, much before the beginning of, the, of this century. Um, and I'll, I'll describe in a moment what I mean by the, the expansion in the definition of rape. So in that sense, we've become more punitive um, regarding sexual behavior. On the other hand, we've also become more permissive in how we deal with conduct that is consensual uh, or aconsensual. And I'll say a little bit more about what I mean by that. Um, as with the legalization or decriminalization of sodomy, adultery, prostitution in some jurisdictions, especially in Europe, and adult pornography. These are things that once were criminalized that we, in general, no longer um, do criminalize. So the question is, well, what do we make of that? Is there any conflict there? On the, it, at, at some very superficial level, there's, there's no conflict, but I, but I try to show in the book how there is a conflict that emer emerges once we begin to take a, a, a more careful look at some of these offenses. So, the particular perspective that I'm offering is a liberal perspective, and that's a complicated term, but I'm using it not in the political sense, but rather in the philosophical sense or moral sense to refer to the government which um, is ne neutral with respect to most forms of behavior or, or non-harmful behavior, and one which wants to maximize people's autonomy and their, uh, their freedom to live their lives as they wish. It's not really libertarian because as you'll see, there is a, there is a, a, a strong role that the, uh, that, the, that the law and particularly the criminal law plays in ensuring that um, people can live the lives that they wanna live, um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a liberal approach. So specifically, we want a system that will protect individuals in their right not to be subjected to sexual contact against their will, while also 
safeguarding their right to engage in sexual conduct in which they do wish to participate. And the sexual conduct that we're talking about here is qualified, it's private consensual sexual conduct. So how do we, how do we devise a system that is able to do that? That's sort of the goal of the book. Um, another way to frame it is how do we create a criminal law that is neither under-inclusive in the sense that it fails to cover conduct that is worthy of criminalization. In other words, we don't want a system that doesn't cover the bad conduct, but we don't want it to be so inclusive that it's over-inclusive in the sense that it covers conduct that's not worthy of criminalization. That is conduct that we want to leave um, people um, free to make their own decisions. How, how do we balance that? Another way to think of it is in terms of um, the famous Talmudic sage Rabbi Goldilocks, who um, was trying to find the um, uh, you know the, the the perfect mean, the the, the what, what she said was just right. How do we um, how do we achieve that in the area of the criminal offenses, the, the sexual offenses? So um, a, a few more sort of text heavy slides and some uh, a little bit of technical stuff here before I dig into what I hope will be a little more uh, concrete. Um, and the book uh, divides the categories of sexual offenses into three, um, three separate categories. And there's some overlap, but I think the categories are um, important to understand what the project is about. So the first the category is uh, conduct that is involves non-consensual and unwanted sex. I'm not going to say anything really for now about what unwanted sex is, although I talk about it in the book because it's a rather uh, somewhat subtle concept. But non-consensual non sex is something that I think people can understand. Um, and that includes rape and sexual assault in a variety of forms, sexual harassment, which is typically in the US dealt with as a civil wrong rather than a criminal offense, Voyeurism and indecent exposure are two other non-consensual offenses that I discuss. The second category is what I call putatively consensual sex. And it's putatively because it's not entirely clear in every case that, that it is consensual, but um, we sort of assume for purposes of discussion or presume at the outset that it's consensual, and then we examine the extent to which it really is. And the, the offenses that I talk about here are adult incest, prostitution, and sadomasochistic assaults. And finally, a category that I call aconsensual sex, which is sort of my own terminology, but it's, it's sex that involves neither consent nor non-consent, at least putatively, and the two offenses that I discuss in the book are bestiality and necrophilia. Wow. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so let's start first with, I guess, the thing that most people would think of as sexual offenses, which are the non-sexual uh, offenses that involve non-consensual sex. And here we see a dramatic shift in the way the law has defined that offense. So at common law, and common law just refers to sort of not, you know, uh, the law that was received from Britain at the time of the founding, but more generally it, it refers to sort of old fashioned criminal law before the criminal law was updated, especially in the mid 20th century under something called the model penal code. So the common law definition of rape was something like the following. Unlawful force by a man against a woman who is not his wife by force or threat and against her will. So notice a few things about that. First of all, it can only be committed by a man. It can only be committed against a woman. It can only, it has to involve sexual intercourse as opposed to other kinds of uh, sexual behavior. It had a, what was called the marital rape exemption, meaning that a, a husband could not rape his wife. The theory was that by marrying him, she essentially consented to um, always having sex. Uh, and uh, it had to be by force or threat and against her will. So there had to be some physical overpowering of the woman in order to commit the offense. So that's sort of, that, that's a quite an antiquated definition of uh, rape, although you can still find it maybe in a couple of codes. Uh, since we have 50 different states, we have 50 different criminal law systems, but it's, it's, it, this is pretty much a, a, an anachronism. Um, 
uh, in terms of the way we define rape. The more modern definition of rape looks something like this. The penetration, no matter how slight, of the vagina or anus with any body part or object or oral penetration by a sex organ of another person without the consent of the victim. And I promise there won't be too much more of, of this kind of language um, in case it makes people uncomfortable, but it's hard to talk about the sexual offenses without some of this, some of this sort of language. So note how much broader it is. First of all, um, it applies to things other than sexual intercourse, other kinds of penetration. Um, it can be committed by a man on a man. It could be theoretically committed by a woman uh, against a man. And I'll, I'm not sure if I'll have a chance to say how that happens, but uh, we'll talk a little bit about rape by deception and rape by coercion. Um, and it doesn't require any force as such. It just requires no consent or non-consent. Um, so it's a much broader definition than we saw in the earlier formulation at, uh, at common law. But it's still limited to penetrative sex. It obviously could also involve people who are, uh, you know, gender, uh, who are of neither gender. Um, it's, not, it's not limited to the male on female paradigm that we saw at common law. <coughs> so at common law, the definition of rape was that it had to be forcible, but the modern definition is non-consensual. And the question is, well, what does that mean? How do you prove uh, that, that sex is non-consensual? What evidence, evidence must be offered to prove non-consent? And so here, again, you'll forgive me if I show you a, a fairly complex slide. I think this is the last one that's going to be like this. Um, I'm going to contrast now the, the, the ways that non-consensual sex was defined. Under the traditional approach, Rape was committed where penetrative sex was obtained through force or threatened force. That's sort of the paradigm case. So somebody jumps out of the bushes, you know, with a knife, holds a woman down, forcibly um, has intercourse with her or other penetrative sex. That's kind of the, 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 the classic uh, stranger rape case, if you will. But there were other ways in which you could commit rape, even at common law. Uh, for example, where the victim was a juvenile, we call that statutory rape. And in certain limited cases where the victim lacked capacity to consent, for example, if she was asleep, asleep or unconscious, or through deception of certain very narrow types, and I'm going to say more about that, uh, specifically fake medical procedures and spousal impersonations. Okay, So it was a pretty limited, beyond force, which was really the core of what the offense was, there were a number of other uh, circumstances in which rape could be proved, but they were, they were quite limited. The contemporary approach, the, 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 the modern approach that's been adopted in many jurisdictions, both in the US uh, and elsewhere, uh, still refers to force or threatened force and still refers to cases where the victim is a juvenile, but it adds to that a number of other circumstances in which we say that consent has been proved. So one, perhaps the most important one, is where the victim says no, or the the, the complainant says no, or in some jurisdictions, including New Jersey, fails to say yes. So we say in those cases where the victim says no, even if there's no force that's used, that a rape has been committed. Uh, additionally, where the victim lacks capacity to consent, um, that's now defined more broadly in ways that I'm going to show you in a little bit. Um, uh, another way in which you can prove non-consent is to show that the consent was obtained through deception. So in other words, she said, yes, go ahead, but she did so under false pretenses. And we'll see how that uh, occurs. Um, in ad additionally, through nonviolent coercion or threat. Uh, and finally, where the defendant and the complainant were in certain, a certain hierarchical relationship to each other. For example, a guard having sex with an inmate or a police officer having sex with someone under his control or a doctor having sex with a patient would be presumptively non-consensual, even if there was no actual proof of non-consent. We just, we just presume that there is non-consent given the hierarchical relationship that exists, okay? So that's the most technical stuff we're gonna talk about and I'm gonna to try to show you what some of this means in practice and why it raises interesting questions. Okay, so I'm going to look first at uh, rape by deceit. What does that mean? 
Um, well, so rape by deceit means that the defendant obtains a sort of no, nominative consent. She said, yes, go ahead, but he obtains it under false pretenses. He obtains it by means of deceit. And at common law, the only circumstances in which rape by deceit could be proved was, there were two. One was where a doctor was engaged in a phony medical procedure. So he said that he was doing a gynecological exam, but in fact, he was, um, you know, he was in, engaging in a sexual act. Uh, this is a still from a wonderful play that was on Broadway about 10 years ago uh, called The Vibrator uh, Play that uh, this is, I'm taking it a little bit out of, out of context because this is not a non-consensual act that occurred here, but it's the best illustration that I could find. And the second circumstance in which rape by deceit could occur would be where there was some kind of impersonation of the intended sexual partner. And the most famous one I can think of is from uh, Bereshi, uh, where uh, Levan and uh, actually Leah trick Jacob into um, having sex with Leah on their way on, on what he thought was his wedding night with Rachel. Um, he is basically deceived into marrying and having sexual relations with Leah, even though, of course, his, his true love is Rachel. So um, under the common law, that kind of deception would have constituted a crime. Uh, we can also see a similar kind of uh, impersonation that occurs in lots of um, uh, dramatic works, uh, including uh, Shakespeare's All Well, All's Well, All's Well That Ends Well, also relies on what's called the bed trick. Um, <laughs> okay, so that's, at, at common law, both of those cases would have been treated as rape. Now, I'm not saying they always would have been prosecuted as such, but at least in theory, they could be treated as rape. But other kinds of deception, probably not. So for example, um, well, okay, so modern, uh, so modern, uh, especially feminist scholars um, have argued that, that that understanding of rape by deceit was much too narrow and that we should broaden it uh, to include other kinds of cases. And they relied on a pretty compelling, what we call a syllogism, a, 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 a logical argument that takes the following form. First, that rape or sexual assault is sex without valid consent. Everybody agrees about that, or at least most modern uh, commentators agree about that. I certainly do. Uh, and consent obtained through deceit is not valid, it, it, would, it would seem, right? I mean, if, if, if you give your consent to something as in a fraud, uh, if you buy a car and it, the, the car salesman misrepresents the, the mileage on the car, then you've obtained it uh, through deceit. It's not, it's not valid deceit. Therefore, it seems that sex obtained through deceit is rape, should be treated as rape. So that's the, that's the argument. So how broadly does that apply? Uh, well, Israel has taken it quite seriously and has a provision that says that if the rape, if, if sex was obtained uh, by deceit in, uh, in respect of the nature of the act, then uh, it constitutes a rape. So in the famous case of um, State versus Kashur, uh, this man, Mr. Kashur, uh, misrepresented himself to a young woman. He said that he was uh, single, that he was interested in a serious romantic relationship, and also that he was Jewish. And he wasn't any of those things. She agreed to have sex with him, and he was subsequently prosecuted, convicted, and had his conviction upheld by the Israeli Quite a controversial decision. So you might you know, you might say, okay, well, that seems reasonable. Uh, what about other kinds of cases where deceit is used? So for example, uh, this is long after my time uh, of dating, but there are sites uh, in which people find mates. And as I am, I'm told that people sometimes misrepresent their bona fides on these sites, their age, their income, their uh, talents, or, uh, or, or what have you. So if they obtain sex pursuant to those uh, misrepresentations, should we treat that as rape or the, the lesser offense of sexual assault? What about people who have um, <laughs> plastic surgery? And I try to be bipartisan here. I found a Republican and a Democrat. Um, they both look a lot better. Um, and maybe someone would not be willing to have sex with them in their 
uh, unreconstructed uh, form. Uh, uh, so do we want to regard that as a kind of rape by deception? Um, what about people who lie about birth control or who lie about whether they have an STD? Uh, that seems like a pretty serious kind of misrepresentation. We might want to treat it as some kind of a crime. Do we want to treat it, though, as a sexual crime, as rape or sexual assault? And finally, a fascinating line of cases involving people who um, have, are, have uh, transitioned to uh, a different gender from that which they were assigned to birth, call them transgender, trans, um, and there have been cases in which their sexual partner subsequently discovered that the person with whom they had sex uh, had a different trans, a different cisgender than their birth, than that their current gender was different from what was assigned at birth, and have been upset about it, have sought to press charges, and there's a whole uh, literature on whether we should treat that as a form of rape by deception. Okay, another another broader form of rape beyond rape by deception are cases of nonviolent coercion. I'm going to sort of race through this uh, quickly. So um, I think I'm just because I'm running a little short on time, but th this involves quickly cases where somebody says, um, you know, engages in coercive behavior. If you don't have sex with me, I'm going to file for divorce. If you don't have sex with me, I'm going to report you to immigration. If you don't have sex with me, I'm going to break up with you. That's certainly coercive behavior. Um, do we want to treat it as a form of, uh, a, 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 as a crime? Um, the last slide, how do I go back to the last slide? Let's see. Shows somebody who threatens, a police officer threatens to give somebody a parking violation uh, or a teacher threatens to give a student uh, a failing grade on a test unless the student has sex. Most people would agree that that sounds like criminal behavior um, because in both cases they're th threatening to do something which is um, not really lawful for them to threaten. But in these cases, they're threatened to do something which is at least lawful on its own terms. Okay. And then we have the <laughs> famous, you know, casting couch uh, where somebody says, I, I won't put you in my movie or I will put you in my movie if you have sex with me. Um, obviously a topic that we saw a lot of discussion of in connection with Harvey Weinstein, for example. Um, and there's a lot to say about that, but I'm going to move on. I'm glad you got there because I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, so and I, I can talk more um, in the question time. But so the the difference, though, between these, arguably the difference between some of the earlier cases was that there he was threatening to do something that made the person worse off. In the case of the casting couch, at least in some cases, certainly not all, as we saw in Harvey Weinstein's case, sometimes there he's threatening to make the complaining better off than she otherwise would be. So from a moral perspective, it has a different balance to it. Okay, quickly, um, uh, an additional way to prove non-consent is by proving that the defendant lacks capacity to consent. And traditionally that was understood as involving something, somebody who was physically helpless or in incapacitated, but it's been broadened in recent years to include people who are intellectually or mentally incapacitated as well. well. What does that mean? What are the implications of that? So when Bill Cosby, um, you know, put uh, a sedative in the drinks of his would-be sexual partners, I don't think anybody would, can, anybody would dispute that that should be treated as a form of rape um, to render your sexual partner basically unconscious in order to have sex with them that would have been a sexual uh, offense even at common law. But what about cases like um, this um, Anna Stubblefield, who uh, was a professor at Rutgers, um, who had sexual relations with a young man who um, suffered from severe uh, birth defects of various sorts, by all accounts, she seems to have fallen in love with him. She convinced herself, at least, that he was able to com communicate with her, and she had sex. She offered to leave her husband in order to um, uh, take up with uh, the young man whose name was DJ, um, and she was prosecuted and convicted and sentenced ultimately to uh, sexual assault for her 
uh, behavior, despite the, the fact that you know, her motives at least seem to have been fairly benign. Um, another related and interesting case involves uh, a couple in Iowa. Uh, both of them were widowed uh, from earlier marriages. They met each other when they were in their, I think in their 60s, they fell in love. By all accounts, they had a very affectionate and loving relationship. Unfortunately, um, Mrs. Young uh, uh, became, uh, suffered from dementia and had to go into a nursing home. Her husband, Henry Rayons, continued to visit her and um, had some kind of sexual contact with her, which uh, Mrs. Young's daughter was uh, opposed to. And he was ultimately charged with sexual assault of his wife um, on the grounds that she lacked capacity to, to, to give consent. Um, finally, in um, a wonderful short story by Alice Munro that I think was made into a movie, though I haven't seen it, uh, called The Bear Came Over the Mountain. Um, the, uh, the long married couple, um, similar story where she, uh, the wife becomes uh, unable to uh, deal, for, deal to, to protect herself. Um, well, she, she, she becomes, uh, demented, she goes into a nursing home, and there she has a relationship with a, another patient at the hospital who offers also suffers from dementia. So it's a little bit different from the previous case, because here we had uh, the husband who did not suffer from dementia was having relations with his wife who did suffer from dementia. Here we have two patients who um, seem to be having relationships with each other, although um, Alice Monroe is not explicit about exactly what the nature of the relationship was. Now, the problem is that if we say categorically that people who suffer from dementia, you know, uh, that having sex with a person who suffers from dementia, the result is that um, we may basically uh, require them to be abstinent. We're, we're saying, well, because you have dementia or because you suffer from some kind of mental disability, um, we're not going to allow someone else to have sex with you. And arguably that is, you know, that violates their positive autonomy to have sex. Okay, so uh, what I'm doing is just sort of raising problems. I'm not resolving them. You have to read the book to see what my resolution is. Um, okay, another not form of non-consensual behavior is indecent exposure. And uh, we usually think of indecent exposure, the sort of uh, flashing the uh, uh, trench coat, but there are other forms of, uh, which is clearly, a set, should, is and clearly should be a criminal offense, but there are other forms of indecent exposure that are more problematic. Um, so uh, when people consent to indecent exposure, if they go to a strip club, whatever we think of that, or they go to see a, uh, a play like Equus, whatever, whatever we think of that, um, I think most liberals would agree that to the extent that people consent to that, we should treat that as, uh, we should not, certainly not criminalize that. But what about cases where the victim or the observer does not explicitly consent to the exposure, but assumes the risk that she will be exposed? Well, assumption of risk is kind of a tricky matter in the criminal law, because we certainly don't want to say that a young woman who goes to a club with a skimpy outfit on somehow assumes the risk of being sexually assaulted, nor do we want to say that somebody who goes for a run in Central Park at, uh, after dark has assumed the risk of being assaulted, even though it may not be wise to do so, or at least in the old days it wasn't. Or somebody who leaves the keys and the ignition of his car, it may be a stupid thing to do, but he doesn't consent to having his car taken just because he leaves the keys in the ignition. So, uh, so consent, the idea of uh, finding what we call constructive consent by means of uh, assumption of risk is a little dangerous in the criminal law. Nevertheless, even though I wouldn't apply it in any of these cases, I would never apply it in the case of sexual assault or non-sexual assault or theft, I think it, it might be applicable in some cases of indecent exposure. So if you go to a Mardi Gras parade, or you're walking by the French Quarter on Mardi Gras, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to see some body parts that are being exposed. You may or may not consent to that, but you've at least assumed the risk. If you went to a concert um, by, um, Jim Morrison, the late rock star, 
Um, my understanding is that Jim Morrison used to stand on stage and expose himself. Uh, in fact, he was prosecuted for doing so. Um, but anybody who went to a Jim Morrison concert kind of knew uh, and arguably assumed the risk that they might be exposed to that. Similarly, somebody who hangs out near a uh, nudist beach also might have assumed the risk, even if not explicitly consented to such exposure. What about cases where the victim or the observer has neither consented nor assumed the risk, but the offender nevertheless has compelling reasons for the exposure? So two examples are of both political kinds of protest. In one case, this is just in the last uh, couple of years on the right, was uh, some protesters went into the UK parliament and exposed themselves. Uh, they were protesting, I think, global uh, climate change. Uh, from an earlier decade, there were protests against the Iraq war. And in both cases, the protesters used their nudity in order to achieve some sort of shock value for their, their cause. Now, part of the problem with indecent exposure is that it's quite, it's quite culturally uh, specific and even it might be generationally specific. So uh, older people, for example, might have a different tolerance for certain kinds of um, uh, indecency than younger people, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Uh, as Cole Porter famously wrote in olden days, a glimpse of stocking was looked at on as something shocking, but now God knows anything goes. Huh. I think he had a good point. He had a um, very good point. Right. So unlike the other sexual offenses, indecent exposure involves a notion of offense as opposed to the usual kinds of harms. I'm not going to say more about what that means for now. Okay. Uh, Jewish law. Uh, Talmudic law takes a pretty strict view about what's decent and what's not, saying that a, a woman's exposed leg is considered nakedness. A woman's singing voice is considered nakedness. Even a woman's hair is considered nakedness. Um, if you saw the film Unorthodox, the, the memoir of Deborah Feldman, there's a pivotal moment in the movie where this young Orthodox, previously Orthodox woman, sort of takes her uh, wig off and exposes herself in some sense. And it's quite a moving moment in the film. Um, I think it makes a point about how culturally specific these kinds of norms are. Uh, last year, or a couple of years ago in Jerusalem, there was a protest. Now the photo is moving. Yeah. Wow, didn't know I was gonna do that. Um, and it's quite a, quite comical, there was a, uh, there was, there was to be a, something called the Eurovision um, song contest that was going to be held in Jerusalem on Shabbat. Uh, lots of uh, Haredi were quite opposed to it. They held a big demonstration and then uh, some more liberal women showed up uh, and they took off their blouses, uh, keeping their, I guess, their underwear on. And the men were kind of really, really, freaked out by it and they ran away and there's a there's a there's a video of that so okay finally Well, that probably makes the point better than I can. Okay, moving quickly on, because I don't have that much time left. So we've been talking about non-consensual offenses. I'm gonna talk about one putatively consensual offense, uh, which is, and uh, which you'll see is incest. But, but here we're talking about things like sodomy, incest, prostitution, and sadomasochistic assault. This is behavior that notwithstanding it's being putatively consensual, nevertheless, has been or is criminalized. Now there's a famous Supreme Court case um, from I think oh, 2007, something like that. I can't remember, Lawrence versus Texas in which the Supreme Court said 
that it was unconstitutional for Texas to criminalize homosexual behavior. It's one of the great case civil libertarian Supreme Court cases. And after that case was decided, a lot of people said, okay, well, what's next? What other kinds of consensual behavior might not be, uh, might also be beyond the scope of permissible uh, criminalization? Um, one of those is adult incest. So adult incest as opposed to, we're talking here about incest between two adults as opposed to incest involving children, which is really a very different phenomenon. Uh, the Bible takes a pretty harsh view of adult incest. You can look it up in those verses. Um, New Jersey is a little, a little more permissive. For some reason, New Jersey has never gotten around to criminalizing adult incest. There was an article in New York Magazine a few years ago in which a woman wrote about how she was having a sexual relationship with her father and she lived in Michigan and she felt like she was subject to harassment there. And they said, well, what are you going to do? And she said, well, I'm going to move to New Jersey because they won't criminalize it there. And, um, and some people in the legislature didn't think that was such a good idea and they tried to pass a bill and for whatever reason they weren't able to do it. I've never been able to find out exactly why. So it's still legal to have sex with your dad in New Jersey, as weird and horrible as that sounds. Uh, Germany, famous case of uh, Patrick Dubing and Susan Karaluski. They were siblings who were reunited as adults. Um, they had three child, four children, I think, three of whom had quite severe birth defects, um, and they uh, the, the state sought to criminalize them and prosecute them, and uh, take the children away from them. It's a very sad case, um, but. Uh, the fact is that we allow, in our liberal society, we allow people to have children, even though they may be at great risk of certain kinds of birth defects, unlike uh, we did 100 years ago in uh, a case called Buck versus Bell. So in the pre-eugenics, uh, or in the, in the eugenics period uh, uh, of the early 20th century, it was viewed as an appropriate role for the state to limit that kind of contact. Um, but after the horrible experience of uh, eugenics in the, uh, under the National Socialist, um, I think we are very, very nervous about the state trying to regulate people's reproductive uh, uh, rights. Um, the film director um, Klaus Kinski and his daughter had a relationship when they were adults um, when she was an adult, rather. Um, but allegedly, the relationship began when she was much younger, uh, not quite this young, but when she was a teenager. And um, so it's, it's questionable how consensual, truly consensual, that relationship was when she was an adult, given that it had begun at an earlier stage. Okay, Fine. the final category is what I call the aconsensual offenses. So, so far, we looked at non-consensual offenses like rape, and indecent exposure. Um, we looked at one consensual offense, namely adult incest. And now I want to look at one more category and one example of that, which is the weirdest of all the examples I'm going to give, namely bestiality. <laughs> you did promise weird. I did promise weird. And, and, I, and I came through on my promise. So um, in some ancient societies had a rather permissive attitude about bestiality. Uh, including uh, especially Roman mythology, Zeus in the form of a swan seduced or raped, depending on your reading, uh, Leda, uh, she became pregnant as a result. Other ancient societies also permitted uh, certain forms of sexual relations between humans and animals. The Hebrew Bible, however, took a very, really very strong position against bestiality in at least well, four different places in Torah refers specifically to the prohibition on uh, such relations. So most U.S. states and most other countries have traditionally prohibited bestiality, um, and but mainly on sort of religious grounds. Um, but in a modern liberal society, that's problematic. I mean, after all, Rabbi Greenstein notwithstanding, I mean, I think most people the, the, the traditional reading of Torah regarding homosexual relations is that the, the Torah prohibits that. I understand that Rabbi Greenstein has an alternative reading, but if you now permit 
that kind of behavior, which is ostensibly or arguably prohibited by Torah, then I think it's worth asking whether you also want to permit other kinds of behaviors that um, are prohibited for arguably for religious reasons. So what we've seen is a shift in the rationale for bestiality, away from viewing it as a form of sexual perversion and instead looking at it from uh, as a form of animal exploitation. Um, so the New Jersey statute, uh, the provision that prohibits bestiality isn't in the criminal code, it's in Title IV, which concerns agricultural and domestic animals, and, and you can read the text there. So it's not even viewed as a sexual offense at all, but it prohibits having sex with a, uh, or having sexual behavior with an animal. Um, now, uh, I'm not going to say that there is any great, you know, groundswell to try to criminalize bestiality, but there's certainly sort of at least uh, at the margin some discussion of it in Al Edward Albee's wonderful Pulitzer Prize winning play, The Goat, uh, which he sort of used as a metaphor for homosexuality. Albee himself was gay. Uh, he was writing at a time when uh, gay rights were beginning to, you know, come into public uh, debate and attention, and he wrote this wonderful play which describes uh, a ha apparently happily married couple. Um, he's at the height of his success as an architect. He has a wonderful loving wife and, a, and, and son. And he comes home one day and announces that he has fallen head over heels in love with Sylvia the goat. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite an amazing play. Um, and it kind of pushes us to think about, well, why exactly do we, are we so repulsed by that? And what is Albie trying to say about the regulation of sex and so forth? Now, I'm not saying that Albie says that this is a good thing, that people should engage in this kind of conduct. He certainly is disgusted by it. Nevertheless, I think Albie's play uh, kind of raises the issue in an interesting way. In Germany, however, there actually was a movement by so-called zoophiles, self-proclaimed zoophiles who said that they loved their animals that they were having sex with, that they meant no harm to them, that they were having, you know, loving kinds of relationships with them and that the, that the law should not uh, prohibit that kind of behavior. They were unsuccessful in their attempt, but it's quite an interesting social movement. Now, think about the way we deal with animals. I mean, uh, we don't allow people to have sexual relations with animals. However, we do allow people to spay and neuter their animals. That's a pretty significant infringement of their sexual freedom. We uh, breed animals, cows, dogs of all sorts. I mean, that's, that's what our whole agricultural system is built on. We put animals in circuses, in zoos. We have puppy farms. We have animals who, uh, uh, you know, um, go through, I don't know if you can still ride them in Central Park or not, there's been a lot of controversy about the animals who pulled the buggies um, in, uh, in, in New York. Uh, all of those are pretty serious infringements on the autonomy of the animals. Uh, and animal rights people are, are un understandably concerned about uh, the way we treat animals. Not to mention the fact that we kill billions of animals every year um, through hunting, through factory farming, uh, and other uh, other means. Um, so it's a good question, I think, whether uh, it makes sense to allow all of this kind of behavior, but to prohibit uh, sexual behavior with, uh, with animals. Um, and I'd be happy to talk more about that. I think that's the end of my presentation. You can buy the book, the usual places, including uh, at Amazon. And I'm now going to get out of my PowerPoint. So you you can rest your voice. Okay. I haven't seen any questions pop up, but um, okay. let's open the screen and um, see what I can find here. I he see something from Carney, who's obviously read the book. Of course, there was a comment about your clip, and they wanted to know if that was Benny Hill. Um, gosh, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, well, <laughs> David and John decided it was. So, okay. um, Carney. I don't know how I found that, actually. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> Carney, do you want to just uh, unmute yourself and talk about this, or do you want me to read your question? I see you there. You're muted, Carney. I, I got it. I'm on. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, 
I was I read read with interest your short piece about Aziz Ansari's unfortunate encounter, and uh, it was very specifically focused on the law of counts and how a broad definition of sexual offense can lead to this avalanche of charges. But you said you deferred discussion on whether that was unwanted yeah. or non-consensual. I wonder if you ever came to a conclusion about the encounter itself. Yeah, I think I maybe maybe yeah. I didn't. You need to just give some people yeah. the back. And everybody right. may not. So Aziz Ansari is a uh, actor, a comedian who <coughs> was um, the subject of a uh, online expose about a date with him, written by a young woman who had gone out on a date with him, and he he behaved in a pretty boorish manner, to say the least. Although there was no allegation that he had engaged in sex with her without consent. In fact, when she finally said enough is enough, uh, he immediately stopped. But pre preceding that, he and, he and she engaged in a very, you know, a, a whole series of different kinds of uh, sexual behaviors. Like, I don't remember, Carney, how many it was, seven or eight or nine different things. Pretty much everything you can think of. Exactly. Yeah, you know, so you can use your imagination. I mean, and the book describes, the book quotes exactly what was involved. And the question I asked was, well, Okay, let's assume that they were non-consensual, just for purposes of discussion. You know, the we talk about in the criminal law the law of counts. In other words, how many charges should you bring? Is it a charge if he touched her on the shoulder? Is it a charge if he touched her in her more private area? Is it a charge if he forced a kiss on her? Is it a charge if he um, uh, stuck his tongue in her mouth or so, or some other part of her anatomy? And it's just. That, that was the point I was making there. Carney's question, though, is whether I think that um, what Aziz did, uh, you know, should uh, should be treated as a crime, or what do I what do I think about his behavior? And I guess my inclination is to say that you know he's a pretty boorish guy. I certainly wouldn't want any friends of mine to go out with him. But it seemed to me that um, he didn't, uh, you know, that. He, he didn't impose on her any any non-consensual behavior. Some of it may be, this is the distinction between what's consent, non-consensual and unwanted. And unwanted- yeah, that's, what I, that's what I was after. Yeah, and unwanted behavior, I do have a discussion of that. Unwanted behavior is behavior, somebody says, um, you know, imagine long-term sexual partners and one says to the other one, I really like to have sex tonight. The other one says, well, I'm really not in the mood. And the other one says, but you know, but please, you know, this would really mean a lot to me. And the other one says, oh, okay, fine, go ahead. Something along those lines. And you could say, well, that's unwanted because there's no real desire there. There's no real motivation, but there is consent that's been given. And some feminists take the view that a lot of sex is unwanted and particularly marital sex is, is often unwanted and that that's, that that's a problem. Now, I, I think it may be culturally a problem. I think it's a moral problem. I think it's Im immoral to sort of, you know, have sex with somebody who doesn't really want to have sex. But I don't, but it's a fine line between whether it's something is really non-consensual or merely unwanted. And it seems my reading of the Aziz Ansari case was that the kind of sexual behavior that he had with this young woman at most was unwanted, and as soon as she indicated that she didn't consent, he immediately um, stopped. Uh, so to me, that's sort of, that doesn't sound like a crime. It may be bad manners, it may be a social problem, but I, I'm I would be nervous about criminalizing that kind of behavior. So staying on that, thanks Stuart, staying on that topic, Sarita is saying, has the definition of consent been influenced by informed consent? Um, and she's talking about research with human participants. Um, yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think the, the short answer is that it, it's, a good, it's, a good, it's a good question because it shows the difference between, you know, medical procedures, which are legal, there's, there's a legal, um, consent that's given, a lot of papers are signed, um, it's all very formal, and a lot of sexual behavior that is almost by definition much more personal, non, um, 
it's 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 legalist it's it's non-legalistic it's it's personal um uh, kind of contact between people and much harder to regulate now some people would you know there are apps apparently that you can download to your phone in which you can actually get formal consent from your partner so you're out you know you're out on a date and you're ready for the big moment and you say okay well let's just go through the consent um uh, so that that's you know there there, there have been there have been suggestions that we should try to uh, make the, uh, at least in these kinds of date cases, um, that we should try to make them more formal because that, because any ambiguity is about whether there's consent should be construed against assuming consent. And the best way to do that is to document it in some way. Um, I was actually, you know, um I'm actually not thinking about just medical. I'm thinking about the whole Belmont codes, and there's a there are big issues in conducting human part, uh, research with human yeah. participants about when is someone capable of consenting. And so that's why I wondered if there's this bi-directional influence in terms of research and sort of the criminal code. Yeah. So I mean, regard that goes back to the whole question about who's you know capable of consenting. And I think there's a tension between, on the one hand, the notion that you know, it used to be in sort of the old days that somebody had a, suffered from mental disability, they were in a home that we just said, you can't have sex because it's, it's you're not capable of it, uh, or you're gonna to be too promiscuous, so we need to protect you in kind of a paternalistic way. And there's been, a, at least since the 1960s, with Eunice Shriver and other people who are advocating the rights of people with disabilities, they say, no, you know, why should we just deprive people um, who have mental disabilities of, of the opportunity to have sex in, in their lives. So there's a, there's a, real, uh, there's a real tension there. Um, and I think as our population ages and we have more cases of dementia and so forth, you know, which is a very much of a continuum kind of phenomenon, um, that this, this problem is going to, is, is going to uh, continue and, and become more significant. So, um, you have turned so many things on its ear for me, um, and I'm sure for the others listening. Um, I will open up one more question, and then I'll close it down. Any more questions? I don't see any. I think people are trying to process this um, quite wonderfully in terms of um, trying to figure out what what is legal what is not legal and i, yeah. I was there was a an, an interesting article that is parallel jerry has hang on one second parallel to what you were saying um about the development of rape kits and it was in the times i don't know a week ago two weeks ago which really went to the whole question of how the view of rape evolved and what that meant and so just looking at your continuum of how things are both closing down and opening up is really quite mind bending. Let me, Jerry had a question. Let me see if I can get him to unmute and ask it, Jerry. I'm, I'm unmuted. This okay. is a double yeah. question. Double question. First, since we know a little bit about the casting couch, was it prostitution? Or was it forceful, forceful rape? <laughs> yeah. That's an easy question for the last question. When, when, <laughs> when you get married, for better, for worse, and, 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 and you enjoy sex all your life with your partner, and they have some dementia problems, does that mean they no longer have feel good? And w w why do we assume that they would not like to have sex at that point in time? Okay, so um, the, the, the casting couch prostitution uh, question is a very interesting one. I have a little piece that I wrote. Um, you can Google it, I don't know. I, I forget exactly where it appeared. It was an op-ed piece about that during the Weinstein trial. Um, and so uh, I think that, um, you know, in some cases the casting couch is just coercive sex. So if Harry Weinstein, uh, allegedly said in some cases, you know, you're gonna, not going to be in my picture. I'm going to punish you. You're never going to work in this town again unless you have sex with me. That's coercive. That seems to me that's clearly a case of rape or sexual assault, or arguably should be. 
That's different from a case where he says, I will make you a star. Um, I will give you something of value in return for a sexual favor. That's a very different dynamic. He's offering to make the person better off than she otherwise would be. And I think technically that's a kind of, that's a form of, that sounds like it satisfies the, the, the specific definition of prostitution, um, which is an offense I, I write about in the book, although I didn't talk about it here. Um, nobody's really ever prosecuted in those kinds of cases, but I think we have a very problematic uh, treatment of prostitution. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that um, we're sort of all over the map in the way we, we, we tend to uh, basically prosecute, you know, street walkers, you, often minority women. Um, that's, that's, those are the people who get prosecuted, uh, the people who are at a, a more higher uh, socioeconomic level, whether they're Hollywood starlets or not, are, are just not going to be subject to um, criminal prosecution, uh, nor are the people who are obtaining sex from them. So it's a, it's a very interesting question. The other question was about the couple where she's got dementia. Yeah. Well, I mean, the problem is that if you take seriously the notion that, um, you know, someone who lacks capacity, I mean, we would all would agree that if somebody is, has been drugged by Bill Cosby or someone is asleep or somebody is uh, brain, brain dead, if so, someone is suffering from severe kinds of mental disability, uh, then it should be a crime to have sexual relations with them. It's much harder when you have long-term relationships where one of the partners loses the ability to, um, uh, you know, make those kinds of decisions. And that I think is uh, a problem that we haven't really sorted out. And maybe it's not susceptible to being sorted out in a categorical way. Maybe it's something that- uh, Well, they, they were married. They were married, they had sex yeah. for a lot of years. Yeah. and and. You know, and frankly, you don't st stop loving someone because they get sick. It wor works both ways. I think. Yeah, but on the and other hand, maybe. And, so someone else can, and if, I mean, it's, you know, no, no foul, no harm, no how, harm, no foul. I mean, they've been having sex forever. And now, now the daughter comes in and says, and you don't know if yeah. you don't well, know that, that case, she was, and you don't know how, how, whether she enjoyed it or not. That case went to the jury. It was it was it was tried in Iowa. It went to the jury. I think the jury returned an acquittal in about fifteen minutes. I mean, so the jury, you know, didn't think that it was an appropriate case. But I think the daughter was very concerned about the welfare of her mother, and she pressed the prosecutors to to take the case. Um, so I, I think that it was probably the right outcome. The jury, you know, I wasn't there. I didn't hear the testimony, but the jury didn't think that this was an appropriate case to to convict. And with that, I'm going to say thank you because this was really wonderful. We can't hear the applause, just mine, but it was wonderful. And, um, and, and you're right, being able to see your slides made this um, flow beautifully. So thank you, Stuart. I want to remind you all, next week, July 7th, we will return. And there's a change in the calendar, and you will see the updated calendar, I think, tomorrow or the next day. Um, but July 7th will be uh, Charlie Steindell. So he's going to talk about the economy, um, and maybe he'll turn the economy on its head, too. So I don't know. And, um, and so join us on the 7th, and you'll see there's a whole list for the rest of July. Again, uh, everybody's saying thank you and um, great, great to see you and thank you for doing this. Thank you, thank you, Shirley. Thanks for coming, everybody. Have a good, good job. Time. Bye. Bye bye. Shirley, call me. Bye. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> bye. <laughs> it's about the condo. About okay, but I can't call you tonight. Can I call you tomorrow? Yeah, I'm, I'm around all day. Okay. Work out of the house. Thanks, Jer. My pleasure. Bye, everybody.